fifty years catholics and protestants have had different views about what someone needs to do to get to heaven and now all of a sudden there are protestant evangelicals who are saying that we're all brothers and sisters in christ and that we ought to work together on those types of things is that true i have the differences between the evangelicals and the product are the protestant evangelicals and the catholics been resolved are both sides now saying basically the same thing about uh, how we can get to heaven. Well, that's the topic that we're going to be talking about tonight. And a little later, we're going to give you an opportunity to join the conversation. There'll be a number on your screen, and we'd uh, invite you to call at that time. Also with us tonight to help us discuss uh, that question and hopefully answer that question is Richard Bennett. Richard is a former Catholic priest of 22 years. And he has thoroughly studied both sides of the issue, and uh, he's perfectly qualified to help us answer that question. So I'm sure we're going to have a, a good time tonight and trust that you will uh, benefit from this discussion. Richard, welcome. And uh, we'd just like to have you begin tonight by uh, telling us a little bit of your background. Well, Steve, it's good to be here with you and with the person there watching us. Um, I uh, grew up in Ireland uh, in a devout Roman Catholic family. Uh, my early training was very intense with the Jesuits from my elementary days right up into high school in a Jesuit college. When I finished with the Jesuits, I decided to be a Catholic priest. I wanted to merit salvation. I wanted to be a good, holy monk and priest. And somehow to gain my salvation as I had been taught from when I was very young. I went into the Dominican order. I studied for a total of eight years. And um, I was ordained in Dublin, Ireland, and I finished in the Angelicum University in Rome. In my whole eight years training in the monastery where I was a Dominican friar, I also did a lot of penances. I chastised myself, flagellated myself with a steel chain at one time, and I did a lot of penances to merit salvation and to cooperate with God's grace. I know what it is to be a devout, sincere Roman Catholic. Then, after I was ordained a priest, I was sent uh, to the mission field in Trinidad, West Indies. I have some pictures here of when I was a priest. Uh, the first one shows me here as a priest after Mass when I was um, talking to two women in an outstation in Sangrigandi in the West Indies. The second picture shows me going out to say Mass in another outstation, and um, I was getting ready to uh, say Mass. I was at that stage towards the very end carrying a Bible and not a lectionary because it was at that stage where I was beginning to read the Bible as I will tell you a little bit further on. Then this is me doing an infant baptism. We believe that babies when they were baptized were immediately became born again by the pouring of water. I would sometimes hold up the baby and say this is a new creature. Uh, I really believe that. I thought that my pouring the water was automatic, ex opere operato, as I've been taught, that just by doing the action, the end result was a creature that was now a Christian. Then we have the, um, the picture of me taking part in an ordination. This was in the cathedral in Port of Spain in the West Indies. All the pictures you would see and notice are in the West Indies. Uh, me putting my hands on top of a a head of a, a British man as he was ordained for the priesthood there in the West Indies. And this is me after a, a First Communion Mass where these young people had made First Communion and they're in First Communion dresses and suits. So I was there. It was 1972 that I had a serious fall where I damaged the back of my head in a very serious fall. I was taken for dead, and after three days, I somehow came to life. And that was the turning point of my life because I felt utterly and completely worthless. It was like I was in the dust, and I was in severe pain. It was then that I began studying the Bible. 
You may say, well, why did I not study the Bible all my eight years when I was training? I studied philosophy and the theology of Thomas Aquinas. I did study redaction criticism, higher criticism, whereby we dissected the Bible from a critical, analytical point of view, but not for biblical truth. Like Jesus said, thy word is truth. I studied the Bible only in a critical way, not for God's truth. It was then after 14 years of search in God's Word and comparing it to official Catholic doctrine that I saw that I had to decide for God's truth and cry out to God for His grace that I could be truly born again, a true Bible-believing Christian. And the Lord is faithful. And He saved me and I left the Catholic Church to give the good news to other Catholics because there are many, many of us who have made this transition. That's interesting. Now, the issue and the question that we're going to be discussing tonight is how a person can know that they're going to heaven when they die. And you had studied that from a Catholic point of view, and then when that near-death near experience came and, and you had that injury, you said you started studying the Bible and you saw something completely different. What I'd like you to do as we begin that discussion tonight is go back to those days, as your, your days as a priest. What did you instruct your people? What did you tell those who were following your teaching that they needed to do to go to heaven? Yes, well, that was quite clear, and I think any Catholic would know what the Catholic dogma is. And the Catholic Church is quite clear in the New Catechism, in the Code of Canon Law, and in other things. And I have a diagram here that I had put together that shows the Catholic teaching of how you get to heaven, how you get to eternity. It's called the um, a chart here showing the Roman Catholic uh, path to eternity. We have here on the left-hand side the righteousness that they talk about, which is their own righteousness that is needed. It all begins, you will see, with infant baptism, as we see in the middle of the screen there. You become a child of God when you're baptized, and then somehow you reach righteousness that you're supposed to stay in. But then we have venial sins and uh, going to confession, uh, trying to do good works, and you'll see that there in the middle where it's in red. And then we have, if a person commits mortal sin uh, and uh, they go down to the end line whereby you would go to hell right away if you die in mortal sin. So even though they say you have been made a Christian, you, uh, if you do one sin that is serious, like missing Mass on Sunday, uh, you go to hell and you're there for all eternity. In the olden days, when I was at school, if we ate meat on Fridays, you would go to hell. Uh, then we did all types of good works and sacraments to try and uh, get us out of the state of mortal sin. We go to confession, we tell our sins to the priest, and we would hope to persevere and become righteous enough so that we could get to heaven. If you died with enough righteousness or enough good works, which you were never told how much is enough, but you would get to heaven, and um, the saints somehow were supposed to have gotten there. If you died in the, you see this line here where I have death, uh, if, we, if you died somewhere in between, you would have to go to purgatory and do more sufferings and offer up more things to avoid hell. You see the fires of hell here at the end. The fires of hell would be for those who died in mortal sin, that they had rejected the teaching of the Catholic Church and they did not confess to a priest. So that was the Catholic way. It's still the teaching of the Church to this day. I have another smaller diagram here. This is taken from the Baltimore Catechism, which for years and years was the most popular catechism in the United States. It is still used in some dioceses, and um, it shows temporal punishment for sins. It shows Christ on the cross, then Mary, 
and the saints, and it says, spiritual treasury of the church, satisfaction of Christ, Our Lady, and the saints. And it shows people drawing off from this reservoir called the church treasury. You may say that was back in 1963, 64, when the Baltimore Catechism was published. Yes, it was, and it's still today. The 1994 Catechism, just published by the present Pope in paragraph 1477 says the same thing, exactly as this picture does, that there's a treasury in which Christ's merits are, Mary's merits, the saints' merits, and your merits. You suffer, and you get them into this treasury, and from this, you gain your salvation. Or in the words of the New Catechism, you attain your own salvation. With the help of God, you can attain it. That grace plus works is what we taught people it's quite serious when you come to what the Bible says. Grace plus works. And I noticed on that first diagram that you showed us, it talked about purgatory. Right. And is that in the Bible? It's, there's no mention of uh, purgatory in the Bible. You know, I think, does, it, does the Catholic Church still teach what you taught as a priest? Yes, well, the Catholic Church has additional books in the Old Testament and in the second book of Maccabees, chapter 12, Verse 45, going to 46, it says, The holy and the wholesome thought to pray for the dead that they may be loosed from their sins. Now, that is not in the Bible as such. It is in a Catholic Bible. So they've, put, they've included extra books yes. in the Bible that covers some of these, these some teachings. Some of these, yes, yes, yes. yes. What, you know, if, if the Bible wasn't the main authority until you started investigating it on your own, what was the authority that you fell back on? Well, our authority always was the same. It was the teaching of the Pope. In Canon uh, 749 of the present-day Canon Law, we're told that the Pope is infallible. That means he is inerrant. His word, when he's speaking about faith and morals to be held by all the people, is without error. An attribute of God in the Bible, it's God's word and God's word alone that is without error, infallible. What if the, the Pope would make a statement that maybe the Bible disagreed with or didn't speak to, was it the Pope's word over what the Bible it said? It was the Pope's word was final. I remember in my own life going to say, see the Archbishop and I said, uh, Archbishop Panton, I said, the Bible says we're not to have graven images, Exodus chapter 20. And he held up the canon law and he gave me a gift of it. He said, canon 1188 says we are to have sacred images for the veneration of the people you are to obey the Catholic teaching. That's a good example of the Catholic word coming over the authority of the Bible. Okay. I want to make a little transition here. And, and as, as we listen to what you said about the Catholic doctrine as far as eternal life and going to heaven, it sounded pretty complicated. I mean, there's baptism, there's penance, there's confession, there's mortal sins, there's temporal sins. And uh, to me, that sounds Quite, like quite a complicated system. Well, I only gave you a few. I could have given you much more. <clears throat> what I want to do now is let's take a few minutes and look at some Bible passages. And what I'd like you to do for us is first relate how you looked at them and how you understood them as a Catholic priest. And then let's talk about what they mean, really. Okay? okay. Yes. One of the, the main verses that we might use to uh, explain to somebody how they can become a Christian and go to heaven is in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, that no one should boast. Now, there's two or three things here. Grace. What did you think of, you know, as a Catholic priest, what did grace mean to you, and how did that fit into the system? Well, grace meant that treasury where we had Christ's merits and Mary's merits and the saints' merits, and the channels coming from that were what went into the sacraments. So it was something under the church's control that was somehow channeled to you through the sacraments. So it didn't mean the power of God or Christ Jesus himself, okay. the grace of God. We would say that what it's talking about truly is it's by grace, grace being a free gift, that it's not something that we merit, not something that we earn, not something we deserve, 
but something that is given as a gift. And it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Now, what did faith mean to you as a Catholic? Well, faith means believing in the church. We talk about somebody lapsing from faith, that they didn't believe in the church anymore. We are told that the church has power. We're told that the priests had power. We're told that the bishop has power, and the, of course the pope has final power. We believe in the church and its power. Now, we did talk about Christ, but the power comes through the church. So our faith was in the church. Okay. For by grace, through faith, you, you have been saved. It says, it, and not of your own. It's the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Now, when I look at those charts and as I listen to you, it sounds like a lot of work. And yet the Bible very clearly says it's not as a result of works. How did you handle that as a Catholic priest? Well, of course, we didn't study it, and that was oh. the very one. <laughs> that was the one that gave me real difficulty when I was struggling for a course of 14 years. How can I say I believe in these things when the Bible tells me that it's not of works? And not only was I doing works, but I was the main operator. I was the one who ran seven churches, and I was the one who did all these works for others. How could I believe that somehow I could manufacture the grace of God when we're told that it is God alone who saves, and it is in Christ alone, and that it is not of works? That was the one I had most difficulty with. Okay, good. Let's look at another one. In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, there's a couple of other words here that I think that it's important for us to look at and, and to understand. It says that if we confess with our mouths Jesus as Lord and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved, meaning saved from eternal wrath. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with his mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So it says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Did you do that as a Catholic? Uh, we talked about having faith and uh, confessing, uh, understanding with our mind, but believing on and trusting on and putting all our confidence in the finished work of Christ, no. We did use that word confess a lot, but it was confessing your sins to a priest. Okay. And that was, uh, that first we really didn't deal with, but uh, the word confess, we did use that. It was confessing your sins into the ear of a priest. Okay. One other word, and there's, there's many, many verses that talk about believing. John 3.16, uh, we've all memorized in Sunday school, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. What did the word believe mean to you as a priest? The word believe, uh, again, was faith in the church. We did know that Christ was Savior. We did know that he had died on the cross, but it was be channeled through the church. So our faith was that the church was the true church and we believed that she had the means. And she says in the New Catechism and in all our official documents that she is the means, that she is the way, that is through the church that we are saved and the people are saved. So faith again was by channeling through the church and through the priesthood um, and of which we were part. Okay. Now that you have made that, that life-changing switch, and God has graciously made you his child, what does the word believe mean to you now? It means the righteousness of God, that Christ is in who I live and move and have my being, that he is my Lord, that he is my partner before God, that his righteousness covers me. It is eternal life that I now have, and I just praise him that he is faithful. And the peace that I have now is just glorious okay. to share the good news, particularly with Catholics. If we were to talk to 
a Catholic, or, or really many people who uh, just profess to know God, and we say you need to believe in Christ, they might say, oh, I believe in Christ. But there, a lot of them are talking about an intellectual belief, aren't they? Yes, yes. And really what we're talking about is more than an intellectual belief. I, another synonym, if you want to use that word, is faith having faith in Christ. Uh, and I like, to do, I like to kind of illustrate it this way, that this chair I'm sitting in, we, we might say, do you have faith that this chair will hold you up if you sit in it? And I might be standing up at the time and say, yeah, I believe that. But until I put my weight in the chair, I'm not truly showing faith in the chair. And so the same thing as far as believing in Christ is concerned, you can have an intellectual belief here that Jesus died for your sins, but until you put your full weight and trust onto him and what he has done, you haven't truly believed as the Bible talks that, that's about. That's just wonderful. I remember as a priest, I knew the Psalms <coughs> so well, you know, my rock, my fortress, my high tower, but it wasn't until that I saw that in Christ and resting on him alone, that this is absolutely true. God is my salvation. He is my high tower. He is my fortress. And it's just wonderful to know that you rest completely in him and he is faithful. Okay. Just wonderful. One more I want, want us to think about. And this, I think, is, is very key. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says, But to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Now, there's the word believe again, but the word I want to zero in on is receive. To as many as received him. As a Catholic priest, what did that mean to you? Receive Christ. Well, receiving Christ, of course, for anybody who has come from the Catholic background was receiving Christ in what we call the Eucharist, in communion. Communion. Where we said we were receiving the the body, soul, and divinity were receiving Christ in, the, in communion. That's what we meant by receiving Christ, which we did again and again. We were receiving him into our mouth and into our stomach uh, because we were taking physically uh, the passage in John 6 and the passages to do with the Lord's Supper. And not as the Lord himself said in John 6, 63, um, the flesh profits nothing, it's the spirit that gives life. We should have been seeing it spiritually and having spiritual communion with the Lord. So we took it as a physical uh, receiving Christ in communion. Okay. <clears throat> what does it mean now to receive Christ? To receive Christ now is eternal life. As he said, when we have received his word and know that he is from the Father, we have eternal life. It means peace with God. It means there's no condemnation. It means eternal security. It means a joy that is overflowing. It just means Christ is glorified now and for all eternity. Would you agree that when the scripture says that we are to receive Christ, that what it is saying is that we need to give him our lives, that we need to re receive him, kind of allow him to come into our life as our Lord and Master? Yes, to obey his commandment where he says, this is the work of God. Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he has sent. It's God's commandment that you believe. And it is quite serious if you reject. When he commands you to believe on who he is, and he says that th there is a sin that will not be forgiven, that if you do not believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. That is quite serious. The Lord is quite serious. Believe on. He commands you to do it. Paul the Apostle said, God commands all men everywhere to repent, to give up trusting in works and any system, and just believe on who Christ is. It's a serious matter. It's a commandment of God, and it's by His grace and empowerment that is there for you to accept. Okay. I, w I want to draw a little diagram here that I think is going to summarize things for us pretty well. And uh, when I get finished with this diagram, we'll in invite you to call. You can start calling now. There will be a number on your screen if it hasn't been there already. 
And uh, if something has been said that you would like to comment on, or maybe, maybe something we're talking about isn't quite clear and you'd like some clarification, we sure invite you to call. Uh, we'd love to know what's on your mind, what's on your heart, and discuss those matters with you. But I want to kind of summarize everything that we've been talking about in a diagram here and uh, get a chance for everybody to, to look at it. And something, as we talk about uh, how a person can know they're going to heaven, I think there's three or four things that they need to understand. And we'll begin by just writing the word God and talk about the fact that, that God is perfect. We use the word holy. That means he is without sin, without blemish. He's perfect in every way. And man is anything but perfect. Now, some of us are better than others in human eyes, in human terms. But yet, every single one of us are separated from God. Because all of us, the Bible calls it sin. You can call it impurities. You can call it anything that you want, doing things that are, are uh, uh, you know, evil. D just being unkind, uh, anything like that is enough to separate us from a holy God. It doesn't have to be murder or, or stealing or adultery. Anything that is less than perfect separates us from God. So then, because of that, the Bible says that we're separated from God. It says the wages of sin, what we earn because of our sin, is death. That's what we deserve because we aren't holy like God is holy. So, it creates this gap, this gulf between God and man. And over the centuries, what happens is that man on his own tries to bridge that gap. And that's really what you were talking about, being a Catholic priest, the system that you were involved in, are all the things that you were trying to do to bridge that gap between yourself and a holy God. And what is key here is that no matter what you did, it fell short. There was still a gap. And so because of that, nobody can be good enough to get to God and to go to heaven because God is perfect and nobody can be perfect. So that kind of leaves us with a dilemma, it kind of leaves us without hope. But the Bible tells us that God loved us so much that he sent his own son, Jesus, to die on the cross, to pay the penalty for our sin, and in that way, God came down to man. God reached out to man. The Bible says, while we were still in our sin, God showed his, demonstrated his own love towards us that he sent Christ to pay the penalty for our sin. So there's nothing we can do, but God did it for us. But there's still another, there's another step, or there's a missing link there. there there's just a, a missing fact, because a lot of people, and I think Catholics, you even believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, right? Mm -hmm. But there was something else that needed to be done. The Bible says, and we just read that, that you need to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And that's the last step. And what we were talking about there is that you need to stop trying, stop trying on your own to reach out to God and believe that Christ on the cross paid the penalty and bridged the entire gap, the gulf between you and God, and you put all of your faith, all of your trust, all of your belief in that, you turn from trying to do it on your own and you say, God, I can't do it on my own. I want Christ to become my Lord. I want Christ to become my master. And when you do that and you are sincere, he forgives you. And he gives you eternal life. And that's really how all of this fits together. There's just one other little diagram that I'll put in this. And if this represented our life, you might say that in the center of our life is a throne or a control center. And for those of us who do not know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, we have self 
that's in control, and Jesus Christ is completely outside the life. But when we do what the Bible says, and we turn from our own ways, confess our sin, and allow Christ to take control of our life, Christ comes in, He takes over control, self steps down, and now this person is what we're talking about being born again. And so isn't that really kind of what we're talking about when we talk about what the Bible says about becoming a Christian? That's exactly what, what we're talking about. And so the Bible says that we need to confess our sin, confess Jesus as, as Savior, as Lord, and allow Him to come into our life and make us the person that He wants us to be. We just turn everything over to Him. And you, you did that. Yes, um, the same thing as is explained in, in Paul in chapter 3 of Romans, the righteousness of God is manifest, God's holiness, righteousness, and truth. And it is that now by obeying His commandment, receiving Him, trusting on Him, that I am covered with the righteousness of Christ. And so I'm perfect in Him and He in me. And then I walk secure. And it's freely given by His grace, as Paul says in verse 24 of Romans 3. And that's the beauty of it. You, when you cry out to God, He freely justifies you. And it's God's work, and He alone is glorified. That's right. Again, we would just in, invite you to uh, call if you have a question, if you have a comment, uh, if something hasn't been clear, if what we're saying really doesn't square with what you have been taught. Uh, maybe you've got a completely different view. Uh, maybe you're using a different source for your authority and uh, you would just like to check that uh, against what the Bible says or, or share what's on your own heart. If you have any question at all for Richard, we sure encourage you to call and uh, just to share, that, to share that with us. You know, I, I'm just thinking back to a few weeks ago and uh, I, was, I was actually on the way to our own church on a Sunday morning. And here in Portland, there is a station that, uh, that has Catholic Mass. And I had never really heard a priest talk about salvation or going to heaven. And I, you know, that's even before we had gotten together and talked about some of these things. And that morning, uh, I was tuning across the dial, and there was this young priest on this station. And sounded very contemporary. He, he just really sounded like he was with it, you know. He was young, he was upbeat, and he said, do you want to go to heaven? He was addressing his own congregation and the radio audience, and he said two different things. He said, he said, uh, if you need to go to, if you want to go to heaven, uh, it's good to say that you want to go to heaven. Do your words say that you want to go to heaven? Yes, they do. But then he says, does your life say that you want to go to heaven. And then what uh, he went on to say is that you need to, that you need to not only say it with your life, uh, but you need to do what the church tells you to do. So uh, we have a caller on the line. Barry, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah, welcome to Christian Lifestyles. Do you have a question or a comment for Richard Bennett? Yes, I do. Richard, you have obviously had a realization through the book that's in front of you, and I would like to know, and I think it would be helpful if other people knew, exactly where this book came from in terms of, it, there are the Gnostic Gospels, there's the Gospel according to Thomas, there are all the books of the Old Testament, there, there are various apocryphal books uh, that we've been exposed to. The book that you have in front of you is defined by what? What, what is it? Am I being clear enough for you to answer Yes, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Thank you so much. I will, I'll take the answer off the air. Thank you. Yes, thank you for such an excellent question. Paul deals with that in uh, Romans 3. He, he talks about the, the Jews receiving the Word of God in the Old Testament, that they receive the oracles of God and they preserve them. The Jewish believers held to God's Word and then he talks in Thessalonians about the Christian people receiving the Word of God as it is, not as the Word of man. 
you receive the Word of God as God's Word. The Word of God was so distinctly clear to be life-changing, to be truth, to be the, in essence, God claiming to say His Word and making it emphatic that it is, that the Christian community and believers receive God's Word. And we have from the beginning Peter telling Paul or Peter explaining that Paul had written Scripture and saying how Paul had given the Word. Peter saying that the Word was like a light in a dark place. So from the very time of the Apostles, the Apostles conscious of Christ's Word that the Holy Spirit would call to mind what he had said and would lead them into all truth, they wrote the Word down. So at the end of the first, coming into the second century, we have uh, the early Christians citing all the books of the Bible. And um, we have God's written word. So the Christians receive God's word, and the Jews before that, the believers in the Old Testament, received the word. And so we have. They never received uh, the Gospel of Thomas. There were some who did. And, uh, but unanimously, they received the books that we have now in the Bible. We call that the canon. The canon of Scripture. The canon of Scripture. It was uh, later on, we had two local councils in uh, North Africa, um, the most famous being Carthage, that, that actually gave a list of books. But we had way before that, we had it uh, agreed on what the canon was. Good. Thank you. Good answer. Jim, welcome to Christian Lifestyles. Do you have a question or comment for Richard Bennett? Uh, yes, I just want to thank you for your show. Um, I was a Catholic for uh, more than uh, 40 years, wow. and never once did anybody show me from the Bible how to know for sure you're on your way to heaven. Uh, they always believed in uh, works for salvation, and... Um, I just want to say that uh, I commend you fellows. Uh, you've, you've hit it uh, right on the button tonight. And um, January 5th, my mother passed away. Mm. And um, I did everything I could to, to witness to her and to bring her to the Lord. I'm a Baptist now. And um, I tried to show her Christ. Um, she wasn't interested. And um, I preached her funeral January 7th of this year. And that's the uh, toughest funeral I've ever preached in my life. Um, I preach at the rescue mission, the Portland Rescue Mission. I don't know if you fellows know where that's at. Yes, yes. Uh, we preach there every third Monday of the month. And um, it was tougher preaching to that crowd than it was my own mother's uh, funeral. Yeah. And uh, I thank you both so much that you've put this on the air. Um, I just hope that you would use this demonstration over and over and over again to show that there's uh, the Catholic organization is the largest Catholic organization out there today. And um, I think you gentlemen have really touched on some real uh, basic but hard issues tonight. And um, I'd like to ask you just one question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, what uh, Bible do you read out of? You first. Yeah, yeah. I uh, first of all, I empathize with you, and uh, I pray that the compassion that you speak about there, you know, to your own mother, I pray that all of us former Catholics would have that length and breadth and height and depth of Christ mm -hmm. Jesus' compassion that I can Amen. hear in your voice and I can sense wow. in what you said. Um, and so I, I really thank God for what you have said and the way you have said it. Um, the Bible I like best of all is the, the New King James or the Old King James. Uh, that's the one I, I have in front of me is the Old King James or the New King James. They're the two Bibles I like most of all. Uh -huh. and, and, I, and I personally uh, read, I use the New American Standard Bible for my own personal study and uh, for my own personal reading. Uh, let me just ask one more question if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 2 and verse 33, and I want to show you something. Um, the gentleman there from Ireland, he uses the King James Bible, and I believe that that's the infallible Word of God. Let me just give you an example here. Luke chapter 2, 
verse 33, the Bible says, And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. Jesus was born of a virgin, but yet in Luke chapter 2 and verse 33, the Bible says, And his father and mother. So now we must take that Bible because it's wrong and do something with that. And like the gentleman from Ireland said, he used the old King James. We believe that that's the word of God. If you look at the new American standard, and I'm not throwing stones, uh, we would have to throw that Bible out. And we, we go down the list here of the different Bibles and it says that his father and mother, well, Jesus was born of a virgin by the Holy, conceived by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that's the uh, point I wanted to get across. But I just want to thank you gentlemen so much that you're getting the word of God out. You, it's, we're not picking here because you've touched on a lot of things. And yeah, I appreciate yeah, that. Th thank you for that word. Thank, thank you. you for that word, Jim. You know, let me just uh, mention uh, Jim's question there. And uh, we could do a whole show on just yeah. the, the, the text that were used to interpret the scripture. And that's, that's really what we're talking about here is different manuscripts that were used to, in, to in, uh, translate God's word. And boy, that's a very, very yeah. deep, complicated issue. It might be better just to stick to yeah. salvation. Yeah. Yeah. And that, you know, mm -hmm. there are slight variances, but really at the heart of it all is that Jesus is Savior and Lord, and that the only way that a person can know eternal life is by giving their life to Jesus Christ. And you know, there's time to, to talk about and study some of these other issues, but that really is at the heart of every single thing. Richard, you know, and again, we'd invite you with the remaining time that we have for our show tonight, if you'd like to call, if you have a question or a comment. Uh, to be real honest, if you're watching tonight and uh, you are a Catholic currently, we are not here, to, even as Jim said, to throw stones. We are not uh, trying to badmouth the Catholic Church. What we are trying to do is just to uh, dialogue on the most important, the most important topic, um, and that's eternal life, and uh, how a person can know that they're going to heaven when they die. And if you've got a different view, feel free to call. And uh, we'll discuss it. Uh, we'll give you an opportunity to, to share what it is that you believe and what, uh, what you use as your authority. And we use God's Word, but, you know, feel free to call. We're not going to put you down. We'd love to talk uh, with you about that. Richard, uh, you were a priest for 22 years. And then you found what we're talking about as biblical faith. How has, how did, you know, as a, you were very devout. You were totally involved in your ministry and your service for God. And then we've talked about your conversion. What's, what was the difference? Did, did you feel any different? Was, was, you know, what took place in your life when that change took place spiritually? Yeah, when, by God's grace, I accepted salvation and cried out to him and he saved me and placed me in Christ Jesus then I first of all knew that my righteousness was nothing in myself I was nothing that it was in Christ that I was accepted and that was where Ephesians 1 and 2 meant so much to me that I knew of myself I was dead in trespasses and sins but I was accepted in the beloved as it says in Ephesians 1 and then there came about the ability to be able to give up vices and sins. Now, for years, I had gone to confession besides people coming to me. I had tried to, to live a devout life besides flagellating myself and all the penances I did, but there were certain things that I just couldn't get rid of. Like many priests, I needed a little touch of alcohol to sleep at nights and things that were not serious, but serious as the years go on when you're depending on something outside of God and you don't have peace with God. When I did 
no salvation in Christ, I was able to leave aside vices and habits that before I never could. Yes. Yes. And I knew yes. that there was no condemnation and that now as I am dead in Christ and risen in Him, that I have life victorious because of who He is. And this was the, the big thing, the peace with God and the ability to be sanctified because of who Christ is. And like Paul, I could say, I know that nothing exists in me, good in me, in my mortal flesh, but in Christ, because of His righteousness, I can, standing on who He is, go forward and overcome sin. And that was the, the wonder of life in Christ. So we don't go forward on our own righteousness, but now we have Christ's righteousness. Yes, He Amen. is my rock, my fortress, my high tower, and all those glories of, yes. of the Psalms. Nelson is on the line. Welcome to Christian Lifestyles. Do you have a question for Richard Bennett? Yeah, thank you. Um, you bet. I'm from Seattle. I'm down here on business, and I saw this, and I was quite amazed because uh, this is quite a testimony. Uh, my question really is, we have, my wife and I both have some very dear friends that uh, are very, very, that's the word, maybe very Catholic or whatever, and we really love them, and we're seeking different ways to witness to them and uh, of two of the couples that we know, they both are involved in Bible studies, and both of them have a desire to know the Word of God. And, and I guess what is a good way to, uh, you might say, to start addressing, or where do you start? You don't want to start throwing rocks at what they believe, or, you know, I'm not trying to put myself above them. That's what I don't want to do. So I'm kind of asking, it sounds like this brother certainly having come out of that certainly understands how to witness to him. So I just kind of, what are some ways to start? So I guess I'll, I can take the answer off the air. You know, Richard, I'll, let me ask that same question for those of us who maybe don't have Catholics in our family, but yet we have friends, we have neighbors, people that we love that are just very much uh, embedded in this system and we don't want to offend them but yet we want to share the truth with them. How can we begin to do that? Yeah, I think there are two things. Thank you for your question. Two things, and we've got to be really explicit. First of all, try to show them from the Bible compassionately and with care that there is only one authority. Isaiah said to the law and to the testimony, do not speak according to this word. There's no light in them. Jesus Christ called the Bible, God's written word, truth. Thy word is truth, he said to the Father. Paul said that it was sufficient for everything. Peter said it was a light in a dark place. Try to show them that in the Bible, thus says the Lord, there is one authority. That was the way for the apostles, for Jesus Christ. And get all those texts. Now, if you don't know, you'll see my uh, number come up on the screen, both box number and telephone number and you can write and I'll send you them, all the lists of texts where the Bible claims to be the only authority. And then ask them the question, how are we right before a holy God? What can we sinners do to be right before a holy God? And see how they reply. And then give them what it says in Ephesians, Romans 3, Titus 3, 5, and on and on. How we are right before a holy God. And if you're studying books of the Bible, begin with John and see what eternal life is there. Go through it chapter by chapter. And then maybe Ephesians, how we are made acceptable in God. And then maybe Romans. Study word for word. God's word is powerful and it does not come back to him void. It, it obtains what he sends it to do. I think that is the answer. Yeah, I would just encourage any of you who are out there that uh, if you have any questions like this, if you would like any type of information, uh, any types of suggestions, Richard has a, a whole house full of different resources that he can send to you that will help you. And uh, periodically we've been showing the address and the phone number on the screen. Please feel free to write that down and contact him. Kathy, welcome to Christian Lifestyles. Ooh, sounds like... Are you there, Kathy? Oh, sounds like Kathy uh, left us. So I was, I was saying again, go ahead and feel free to, to uh, write Richard. You know, something that you touched upon there, 
was, uh, and I want to go just a little bit farther with it, uh, a little bit farther anyway, is this whole issue of authority. Because that's really, we touched on it very, just very briefly earlier in the program, that as, when you were going through school, first of all, you didn't study the Bible, and you were taught that the Pope was the final authority? Is that what you were taught? Yes, I was told that the Pope was the authority whereby we had to accept his word. In 1870, we had the first council of the Vatican, first Vatican council, and it was decreed that the Pope was infallible when he spoke from the chair ex cathedra and that his sayings hold the final authority for all, for all Catholics. And that was decreed. It's amazing that the same Catholic Church in um, 1334, uh, another pope called um, John the 22nd, in another decree called um, Quia Corundum, declared that anyone who taught infallibility was uh, teaching a doctrine of demons. But I think you have another call there, Steve. Yes, we sure do. Kathy, are you back with us? Uh, I'm here. Yeah, welcome to Christian Lifestyles. Do you have a question or a comment? I have a comment as a Catholic. Um, Great, thank you for calling. I, you say you don't want to throw stones, but you're throwing them. You're judging, and from what I get out of the Bible, what I understand it to be, we're supposed to love God with our heart and our mind and our words. Absolutely. I don't hear that coming from your show, and I'm curious, Are you what, what religion do you call yourself? Obviously I'm, not Catholics, what are you? I'm a, I'm an evangelical Christian, I guess you'd say. I'm, I'm an associate pastor at uh, Calvary Chapel Worship Center in Aloha, a non-denominational church that preaches the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And, you know, Kathy, we're just, this is, you know, we're, this is all of the authority that we're taking. And, and, and that's I, where I'm taking mine from, too. Okay. And, and I'm a student of the Bible. I've been studying it for over a year now, and I'm not hearing, I'm not finding the things you're finding. I think you're reading in what you want to read, and I don't understand how you feel you're going to live this eternal life by judging others. You're, <clears throat> you spend so much time judging that how can you be doing loving God with all your heart and okay. your mind and your words? Let me ask you, Kathy, what do you tell your friends they need to do to be sure that they are going to go to heaven when they die? To live a good life, which means helping others, helping poor, loving God with your heart and in your deeds. Uh, and by judging others, you're not loving. I don't, I don't think that's a loving thing. When we talked a little bit earlier about God I'm being... I'm sorry, I was at Catholic Church a little bit earlier, okay. Tash Wednesday. <laughs> okay, great. A little bit earlier, we talked about a diagram, and I won't diagram it again. But we talked about God being holy, and then and all men are sinful, and I think that you'd agree with that. All of us have done have fallen short of the glory of God. And women, yes. Okay. And because of God's infinite holiness, only perfection allows anybody into his presence. And so, you know, you talk about doing good. How good do you have to be? How good can you be? If you're 99% holy, you're still 1% short. And so as you're sharing that with your friends, I would say, what do you do with the sin problem? Because everybody has sinned. Then and you God... ask for forgiveness when you do sin. Okay. And just like you do, I would assume. Yeah. I'm... We're going to have to start wrapping things up. I, I really thank you for calling. Richard, are you on the line? Uh, we had another caller, uh, Richard. We've got just about one minute. If if you're there. Can you hear me? Yes, we've got about one minute. Okay, uh, I just, um, rather, than, rather than speak, um, a, lot of, a lot of dialogue, I just, through some of my prayers, I've seen that uh, when, uh, when it comes time uh, for when God looks at man and evaluates his righteousness, he'll, he'll, he'll see whether the man is covered in the blood and uh, it's, there's nothing a man can do. Good works, uh, you can cover the world with good works. And uh, if you're not talking about the blood, it won't do any good. Just like uh, when the Jews were uh, in bondage and the angel of death came, he, uh, he didn't uh, pass over the uh, kings or the uh, taskmasters or the, 
the strongest or the richest. It was uh, it was the homes the, whose blood who, who had the lamb the lamb's blood. And and this is this is a deep spiritual thing, and uh, people should ponder this. And not because I say it, but because uh, because the book you're holding and the book he's holding, I know they say they both say that. Mm -hmm. And to Kathy, I love you, Kathy. I appreciate that. Yeah, could I say something on that? Could yeah, and then I want to read a scripture and we'll close. Yeah, uh, Richard, that was just a wonderful word, and I'm happy you addressed Kathy too. We do love with the love of Christ, and I had said that earlier on to Jim. We want to have compassion. It is compassion to tell the truth. It is compassion to say what Christ Jesus said. It is compassion to want to hold up the message of Christ Jesus that we're saved by grace. And so, Kathy, it is important to speak the truth in love, and that's what we're doing tonight. And it's only God's grace, and it's only what that final Richard said there. It's only the blood of Christ that covers us Cry out to him, and he will show you. And you will know that it's his doing, and that alone. And to him be the glory. As we close, 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13 say this. And the witness is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. This life is in His Son. And what we have tried to share is it's not in the church, it's not in the Pope's decrees. This life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. And that's really what we're trying to say tonight. We really appreciate those of you who have called. Kathy, we wish we had more time to talk to you.